So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good afternoon uh, to you. My name is Willem Omamo. I am uh, your host today for the third episode of the Utopia Hospitality Series, organized by Burma International Hospitality College, also known as BIHC. BIHC is a world-class hospitality training institution based in Nairobi. Uh, we <coughs> offer Swiss diplomas and certificates in culinary arts and hotel management. In addition to this, we offer refresher and short courses for working professionals, as well as customized business to business or otherwise known as B2B professional programs. We're really pleased uh, to be the organizers and moderators of this web series. There's so much conversation uh, out in the marketplace about how to respond to COVID-19 and the best practices. Most of these conversations are at government level. What we're doing here at the Utopia of Hospitality series is engaging the frontliners, those who are hands-on, working in tour and travel, hotels, restaurants, schools, canteens, food courts, delis, bakeries, and even candy shops. Here we aim to capture the view of the industry in the eyes of the frontliners. Now, it's a great pleasure for me today to welcome our panelist, um, Ms. Shima Mirali. Shima is uh, a director of Neptune Hotel and Resorts in Kenya, Tanzania, and Zanzibar. Welcome, Shima. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, it's nice to have you indeed. Shima, uh, just to get things started, perhaps um, you can... Tell us a little bit about how Neptune has, uh, you know, absorbed uh, the situation since March, considering that uniquely Neptune is cross-border. You're in Zambia, Tanzania, in, sorry, in Zanzibar, Tanzania, and Kenya on the Indian Ocean beach. And you're also inland in the, the bushes of Masai Mara. Just tell us a little bit about um, your experience in this in this time? Um, Bill, you know, we, like everybody else, um, we were caught up with, you know, COVID-19. And since March, basically April, we've had to shut all our hotels. So in Zanzibar, the Gora Gora Lodge, Mara, Diani, all our properties, seven of them have been closed. Uh, we've sent staff on leave. We've sent managers on leave. And we've got uh, skeletal staffing that we've kept for the upkeep of the property, you know, the rooms, the pools, the gardens. So we're able to open um, given a 24 hour notice. So we're, we're managing the product, but everything has been closed, unfortunately. So you have, you have seven operations, isn't it? Correct. That's right. Okay. And did, was that closure in, 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 in sequence or did it just all happen at, or, all at the same time? It was basically once that some of the guests in March started to go back, you know, slowly, obviously, with the flights going back, everybody had arranged the operators who, who would leave. So we had started all this on the 1st of April. So from April, um, everything has been closed from April. Mm -hmm. And we've okay. made provisions, obviously, April, May, June. And as everybody knows, nobody really knows when flights and things are coming in. So it's an, it's an ongoing, we're checking the situation every day. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see a, a season in, in, in August, especially when we talk about uh, the wildebeest migration in the Mara, do you see, or do you, is there any activity or any interest for August? You know, the thing right now, I think the situation is, is our, big, our biggest source markets are Europe. And in Europe, um, they're talking about guests traveling within Europe for the time being. I think everything will depend on when they start international travel back to Kenya and what the type of the guest is expecting or wants with COVID-19. Um, for the Mara, there's been quite a few cancellations. So we haven't decided if we're opening in August as yet. It will all depend on the demand and what's happening in the next couple of weeks, um, especially with bookings and what's really happening in our source markets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you talked about expectations. There's so much uh, talk about what's to and what's not to meet expectations. 
how do you intend to adapt to these new protocols at your unit? Um, yeah, so, you know, you're absolutely right. There's so much of what to do, what not to do. There's so much liter literature out there. We've already, we've already started doing a lot of the protocols from our thermal checks, from the, you know, giving all our staff masks to our hygiene in the rooms, to our public area hygiene. We're doing internal training already with the staff. We've done our internal pro protocols that we have shared with our operators already in Europe. Um, obviously, it's an interim one. We're working on a bigger document. We're, we've engaged SGS to come and look at the properties uh, to work with us in how to do this. And we will, we will continue to work with the, the, the protocols from the Ministry of Health, from the WHO, and we'll continue to, um, to put this in effect as we go ahead. What is um, one key? What is one key? One key uh, new protocol that uh, throws a spanner into your work, so into operations. One key thing. I think, I think uh, at the moment, obviously, like because it's a leisure and luxury uh, leisure holiday, um, I would definitely say that while we keep our guests safe and secure, uh, we don't want to make our our hotels feel like we're going to a hospital. You know, with everything to do. With <laughs> at every stop we, we will have that we want to be discreet about it yet make them know that it's happening and i think there's a lot of talk on this uh, buffet situation and as you know we're all inclusive resorts um in zanzibar in uh, in diani and everybody's kind of alarmed what are we going to do with the buffet situation do we take it away and i think that we've social distancing in the restaurants and in our public areas will not be an issue because where we are we've got landscape gardens we've got a lot of space so in this way i think it's got we've got a nice setup in terms of some of the food i think that we'll have to now see how to manage as we go along because as you know when you've got about four or five four hundred and fifty to five hundred clients in a hotel with no buffet uh, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge so i think we will look at some of the terms of reference with um wrapping the the cutlery and crockery obviously more Hygiene is there anyway, but more to be seen um, with the hands and the masks and individual kind of serving. So we'll we we'll look at that. Um, I think from the cleaning aspect, that's quite that's happening already. From you know these new these lots of new things coming in with mist disinfectants and things that we were trying to we're going to look at in the rooms. So I think there's a lot ongoing uh, that we're also getting information on. Um, so I think. I, I, we're 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 very ready, um, unless there's things that change along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, has the government, uh, you know, come in and you know uh, brought you guys together to talk to you about some of these protocols? Is that that conversation at county or at national level, or is there any conversation at all? So what's been happening is I know. With this, we've given our recommendation to um, to our hotel keepers associations, who've taken this to the Minister of Tourism. Um, they're working. Uh, I know that the Minister of Tourism is trying to look at getting all the different associations together to come up with with protocols that work for us. And we are also going to. We've also put forward what our recommendations are, so this we can work in tandem. So it works for our industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, you know, do you see a uniformity in the challenges that will face the East African coast? Um, you know, you're in Zanzibar, you're in Mombasa, you're on the same coastline. Uh, but do you see a uniformity of the challenges or is it the uniqueness or the, or, of each location that makes it different in response? I think being on two sides, I think um, I think they're both unique in the um, on their own. I mean, Zanzibar, as you know, is very sort of mystical. The name Zanzibar, an island destination, is smaller. Um, the hotels are a little bit more secluded. You know, secluded. The beach resorts um, in Kenya, we've had the tourism. Diani is leading beach resort in the world. Um, here, it's a unique experience where you can be in the bush in the daytime. You can be on the beach in the evening. And I think Zanzibar is unique, Mombasa is unique. It is different with the protocols and what's happening at the moment. It's it's um, 
it's quite similar what what is expected so far with the things that everybody's trying to do from the airlines but yet again we're waiting for more information on specifics mm -hmm. okay and do you do you um as, as the, the the coast association uh, let's say the coast association of hotel keepers have you uh, basically been able to come up with um, uh, significant strategies to ad address issues of how to manage the crisis that is affecting your workers and so let's say your workforce. So what we've done is with Hotel Keepers, we've given our recommendations quite a long time ago and uh, they've worked very hard, obviously through the ministry um, with, with, work, with, with our unions and with our workers in terms of leaves. Um, we've looked at, we've not increased the VAT We've talked about moratoriums. And so this is now an ongoing process. We've given the document and this is continuing. This is continuing as we go along. And now we'll come to the protocols and if anybody decides to open and how we go from there. So we're working very well with them and they've done, um, they've presented the document very well. Okay. Now, where predominantly have you been doing your, your training, your staff training down at the coast? Which, is, which are the training institutions that you've been using or have you just had an internal system? So with training, Bill, over the years, basically we've done a lot of in-house training. You know, we do get Utali who gets in touch with us every year to send out our people to them for training. They have trainers coming in. We have a lot of these technical institutes in Mombasa that send us people. They stay with us. We give voluntary training for three to six months in different areas. Uh, so this, this is a system that when anybody ever writes to us, we're always willing to take in trainees at any time. And uh, we, get, we get different colleges uh, from our country and from the coast who do write to us on and off all the time. Okay. So we haven't, we haven't got anything from uh, BOMAS. Well, we look forward. We look forward to, to, to engage with you. What would what would do you see a change in in, 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 in trends that will, will would you would need to come back to us and say uh, this is the, the the kind of training that you need? Looking yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good question because I actually was thinking about that. That I think now with the new type of client that we're all going to see what is the new client, what are their expectations when they're coming to us. Um, I know safety hygiene is of utmost concern. And obviously the colleges, I would think it would be good to put in courses that are on service delivery, but hygiene, safety. So trying to serve to the new type of guests in terms of service and all aspects of hospitality, but in a way, again, that it's not making them feel a certain way. So I think maybe, I don't know if those courses are offered at the moment, but I would think some of these new ways of service with the COVID protocols and this, this um, new normal and the new guest with these new trends, I think some of these courses to be, would be good to offer to the students, the new yeah. students more for the new guest. Mm -hmm. Clearly it's going to need a lot of cooperation and a lot of uh, synergizing the, the, the training need versus what is happening uh, on the on floor. The yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Are you hopeful for the industry? So I'm very hopeful for the industry. We're very optimistic. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be that we're saying we're opening our hotels um, in August and September. Um, I think, again, because our biggest source markets are in Europe, um, definitely we will look to domestic tourism depending on the demand and the numbers. But because these are the source markets, we're still waiting to see what is happening there. And I think this will then give us more information as we go along. Um, people are saying, I mean, you're looking at at least a year, at least a year for, for business to come back to if, to what it should be and what it was. So it's gonna be tough, it's gonna be tough. And I think in this time, what we're doing is a lot of multitasking. Uh, we're looking at our costs and becoming more efficient. And um, just trying to manage with the resources that we have. Obviously, we have there's no revenue, um, but we are hopeful definitely because tourism is 10% um, of our GDP and uh, millions of jobs. 
So I think for the government to jumpstart this part of the economy, this part of the segment of the economy would be a great thing. Because not only with hotels and suppliers and all the other uh, people that benefit, I think this will create jobs and I think it would be a good industry to start with. Okay. In this economy. The other day we were speaking to Jimmy, Jimmy uh, Karaoke, uh, who you know is the CEO of um, Sarova Thank Group. And he's also the chairman of the Kenya Tourism Board. And I asked Jimmy whether he agreed that um, smaller uh, single unit operations have an advantage over big, out, big outfits like yourself in re-entering or reintegrating or even rejuvenating the business. Uh, what, do you, what is your view? Uh, a small, well, I think that for our view is um, because we have bigger units, um, we, if we do open, we would open with one unit, uh, with not, not all units. And I think, again, it would depend on the demand and the numbers uh, when it comes to opening, because there's no sense opening with, with, with smaller numbers, because obviously the costs are higher and it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so for us, if we in Diani, for example, if we decided to open, we would open with one unit mm -hmm. to start with, mm -hmm. to start with. Okay. Do you think the, the, the two operators need to uh, um, uh, relook their narrative of how they sell uh, the Diani coast or let's say the, the Indian Ocean coastline? Is there a need for them to recalibrate how they sell or if, is it okay for them to carry on with the narrative that they have right now? I think the two operators now will have to see, obviously the people are gonna talk about cost. Um, if the Europeans are feeling, are they safe and secure enough to wanna to come long haul, not only to be in your hotel, but if something does happen, what are our facilities outside? Are they available to them? Um, are they safe? Uh, they will, I think they should obviously maybe try and work with, with our tourist boards and our government to come up with um, either a partnership or some kind of uh, offers where we as hoteliers would be there to support this if there are certain um, special packages for a certain period of time to be able to jumpstart this. Um, I think that's something they should look at. Do you see an increase in the room rate or do you see a flat line or what do you see? Don't see an increase in the room rate. Um, actually, I would say that we would have to bake a certain special offers and special packages to try and invite them as to make it you know, a little bit more attractive, although it is attractive, but to make it a little bit more attractive, because I'm sure in Europe, people are gonna be making everything attractive with lower deals and ways to lure the guest in. So mm -hmm. I don't see an increase in rate at the moment, no. And how about the domestic industry, the, the domestic tourist? What, do, what are you gonna do for, for, you know, for, Local tourists. Domestic tourism, um, if things again with flights start opening up, I mean, we're told that maybe on June 6th, this may be the, these county lockdowns will be lifted. And if we know that people are starting to move again and travel and they're safe and comfortable, and if there is a demand, even uh, 40, 50%, then people will start opening their hotels because I'm sure at the moment with all this quarantine, there are domestic people who want to get out and yeah. go away for the three-day break, for the four-day break. And we will make this attractive to them to be able to come. We look forward to making to your offers, uh, Shima. We hope that it really will be attractive. For our own domestic people in, who've been quarantined and sat there for a long time, weekend offers, um, we, we, I think that's, that's very doable. We would, we would like to attract them back and bring them back and yeah. to feel that we can go on holiday and, Again, it is a, it's a safe holiday with yeah. the pro, pro COVID protocols, but we're on holiday. We don't want to feel that we're stuck again in a place where we can't you know, move, again, keeping the social distancing. All right. Okay. Well, we all look forward. I think uh, as early as January, I told you I was coming to visit you. So I hope that I can still maintain that visit. Yeah. Absolutely. But thank you very much, Shima. Um, thank you very uh, much, Bill. Uh, to be with us. We wish you and uh, the whole Neptune fraternity all the very best uh, moving ahead. We do look forward uh, to hear the great offers that you have and uh, we encourage you to just carry on with the same spirit 
and hopefully BIHC will find a place where we can engage with you. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for having me. And um, anything, you can always call me. Thanks very much. So ladies thank and you. gentlemen, thank you. That was uh, Shiva Morali, the director of Neptune um, Hotels and Resorts. Um, we're gonna take a two minute uh, commercial break as we prepare for our next guest. So you can please stand by for that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Shima. Kwaheri. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks very much. And we're connected and we're live. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, to, um, to the show. And um, this is the second uh, panelist we have for the Utopia of Hospitality series. Uh, with us today, this afternoon, is Abdul Bagli who joins us from Cairo, Egypt. Abdul is the CEO of Cotton Harvest Tale, an international hospitality organization that develops luxury hotel and restaurant concepts and innovations. Abdul, Karibu Sana, they say. Welcome. Karibu Sana. <laughs> Abdul, uh, how are things in Egypt? Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how things are up north. Uh, well, um, actually, it's like the rest of the world, you know, uh, start March 15th to, to 20, um, uh, strict measures have been taken in place, uh, flights were suspended, uh, hotels were closed down, restaurants and all commercial places with the exception to uh, food retail and pharmacies. And um, since then, we've been on a lockdown, but not a strict lockdown, you know, starting on a curfew, starting from 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. at 9 until 6 a.m. Uh, most of the um, restaurant entrepreneurs um, in our industry have been very innovative by uh, coming up with the branded food packages that can be delivered from restaurants or doing home deliveries. Um, in some cases, some retail uh, places have also come up with food trucks where they station them in a certain area where people can go and pick up food uh, of the concept to go. So that's it's been that it's been like that for the last 60 days since March 15th until today. And uh, there is um, there's an expectation that it should be uh, it should open up starting June 15th with uh, flights outbound flights from Egypt and hotels and restaurants. So we should expect that coming in around the 15th, 15th of June. So that's into Europe, because we know a lot of countries... That's into Europe. That's into Europe. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's into Europe. But what I'm projecting and what I foresee in the future is that there's going to be much more of intra-tourism uh, taking place within, I mean, locals traveling to beach destinations, uh, to the Western Desert, to the, uh, the uh, Guna, Hergada, Sharm el Sheikh, Sinai Peninsula. That's what I think will happen in the near future. We'll see much more of an influx of um, uh, the tourism taking place. Okay. And you, you, it seems like um, people, entrepreneurs have got very creative over this time. You've seen people have become uh, absolutely, very- Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, many, many hotel, hotel companies, uh, hotel, um, hotel companies, entrepreneurs, developers, Consult. We are much more of a concept hotel, a concept company, rather, uh, um, sorry, a concept hospitality group rather than saying we're consultants. Um, we're not consultants. We develop concepts from ground up. So what we did is we have a concept that we recently developed, which is going to be much more health driven, uh, wellness driven. Uh, there's going to be a small clinic in the lobby. Uh, there's going to be a washing hand sink. Um, it's more of a, an affordable luxury, but more on echo, echo and wellness tourism with one main restaurant. We're not going to have the option of room service. We're going to go ahead and do probably the concept of food to go instead of room service, packaged breakfasts. Um, so um, we, 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 we are taking this opportunity to be much more innovative moving forward, possibly not in the immediate future. But I would uh, I would predict like in within the next year and so um, people were gonna well guests mainly are gonna look for spaces to live in but spaces that are surgically clean and yet um, good healthy food so healthy is gonna be the new glam so we're we're taking that direction uh, many hotel companies have partners with like Hilton has partnered with Mayo Clinic and um, other establishments where they're doing precautionary measures post COVID-19, um, making sure that the hotels are surgically clean and tight, tight, but you don't want to turn it into a hospital too, because you want to go back and get that feel and experience that you always had in the hotel. So that's let what I'm- Let me just interject and ask a little bit, because, uh, you know, 
Abdul, you're in a very unique segment uh, yeah. of the industry. Could you tell us a little bit about this this segment and how vibrant it is? You know, all of this this uh, innovation, creativity around luxury and boutique hotels. Tell us a little bit how you got into it and how vibrant it is. Absolutely. Uh, well, as you know, uh, Bill, I was uh, formerly John manager. I'm not going to mention the name of the hotel company, but I was formerly John manager with a luxury hotel company. And um, I felt at one point that everything that was luxury about it was, yes, tangible product and intangible, which was the emotional and then service experience. But at one point I felt it was not mine and I needed to do my very own. So I decided to go out and partner with my business partner. And we created Harvest Town Tail Hospitality Group, which is much more of a, a concept hotel company. So um, the idea of that is we wanted to create concepts that have much more personality, much more character, independent, a human-like concept. Do you know what I mean? A human-like of a concept uh, of a hotel that, 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 that the targeted audience can engage to and can communi communicate with and live within those spaces. So that's the direction of what luxury is today, actually, I believe. And also equally what luxury is today, it's not anymore about the large chandelier, the marble lobbies and all that. I think it's important also to integrate within that independent, that individual, that character hotel, a local experience, wherever you are. And you take the local culture, you integrate it into the hotel experience. That's what the new luxury is. Equally, moving forward, health is the new luxury, healthy food, um, healthy luxury, cleanliness, and all that. So that's equally, um, also equally important to that, yeah. Yeah, the, there's a lot of literature that supports this idea that the future is luxury, given that um, every year on year, more billionaires are coming into the scene. The world is creating more billionaires. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I do. The luxury world is, is the future. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Do you agree that luxury is the future or is it luxury with, with, with other aspects of luxury? No, I, I, think, I think luxury is personal. I, I strongly believe and I believe that everyone can define luxury in his own way. So luxury is person. What I see is there's going to be luxury that's going to be healthy luxury. There's going to be affordable luxury, not necessarily the luxury we've known for the last 22 two decades or three decades by the most glamorous objects and uh, materials and product that we see. Now, I think luxury can be defined in a different way to each individual. You know, a person that is into yoga, health, etc., will define luxury experience in his own terms. I see luxury for me as much more of nature luxury. So everyone has on the hotel perspective, you will see more of independent uh, echo hotels, uh, luxury independent hotels, more hotels that have personalities and characters, more of those coming in because it's like a tribe. Either you fit in that luxury segment, that specific luxury or you don't. So you're gonna have your own luxury, you're gonna find your own luxury within one type of a hotel that will fit you and you find it in your own um, definition is luxury, yeah? How about um, service apartment luxury, this Airbnb idea? Do you see luxury there? I see luxury there, uh, more on a rental on a boutique level, uh, a collection of 15 to 20 um, villas, mansion in the south of Europe uh, from that luxury segment. Um, I can still speak and say that you see, still see that with certain luxury hotel companies uh, that they have their residences, um, service residences attached to their hotels, uh, still going strong. But um, in the future, um, uh, I'm still not sure about it. Actually, Airbnb is doing a lot of a lot. They're, they're putting a lot of efforts in moving forward. Uh, but again, uh, luxury residents, um, there will be, there will be, a, there's a huge market ahead of that's for sure. Okay. You know, Abdul, you've been to Kenya scouting for projects. Yeah. What is the appetite uh, on the African continent for high-end boutique hotels from your experience? Yeah, I'm a strong believer in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think from a product perspective, innovation, I've been to the luxury tented camps in Kenya. 
um, independent boutique hotels and uh, sorry, luxury tent camps in uh, Serengeti, um, independent uh, boutique hotels in Nairobi. Um, I think, uh, um, and what I like most about it is that they use a lot of uh, local culture, local materials, uh, local DNA, local identity to their properties and I have a lot of respect for that. So I foresee that um, the growth in that area in Sub-Saharan Africa is gonna be very huge in the coming future because the current generation of millennials and uh, even us, Generation X, we seek such experiences and we're going to look for it instead of saying, staying with large hotel companies, Hotel X or Hotel Z. Um, so that kind of a demand, there will be, uh, it will be a growing demand. And I think you will see um, more of those properties coming up in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's for sure, in the very near future. You will see, and, and it's very promising. Okay. And your interests as well, how, how do you, how do Michelin rated uh, restaurants uh, do in Africa? Um, well, we don't, there, there, is, there aren't any Michelin star restaurants in Africa currently. You know, we, we probably could say very good uh, restaurant scene in South Africa and some African countries uh, with um, um, very strong upscale restaurants. But Michelin, not yet. Um, and to be quite honest to you, a lot of the three Michelin star chefs have actually got their three Michelin stars and they moved away from keeping that trophy restaurant and turn their businesses, uh, their restaurants into much more business by developing different type of concepts from a brasserie to a bistro to even uh, food trucks. And they kept the flagship restaurant just to, to, to maintain that uh, prestige of three stars. And then they turned their business into multi-restaurant, multi-concepts of seven to eight restaurants. And that's what generate revenues now. Uh, that type of Muslim star restaurants, um, it's um, huge overheads, very high cost, and the profit margins are pretty low. Okay. So how, how then do you see um, this pandemic impacting your line of work in terms of uh, the, the designs of the future? How, how do you see that? Oh, that's interesting. I think um, we're going to be seeing um, change in designs uh, we're going to look at it from two segments. I'm going, to, I'm going to speak from a food and beverage perspective, hotel food and beverage, independent restaurants, and hotels. In hotel food and beverage, I see that buffets will be eliminated, will be removed from uh, hotels. Uh, it will be either more of a trolley shared service that's going to be out on the tables or the to-go concept, as I mentioned um, earlier. Um, and I see um, a lot of um, antiseptic, uh, strict antiseptic standards, uh, safety health standards, I see hand wash sinks also coming up in the future, elegantly designed that complements the whole entire design language and interior. Um, I see, I, I foresee that there will be the idea of having four to five restaurants. It's just going to be reduced maybe to two to three restaurants, uh, more spaces between tables. Um, no, there's going to be very, very strict standards. And uh, hotel, hotel companies have partnered, for, for instance, like Hilton, Mayo Clinic, and many other hotel companies partner with others. And they're, they're, they're going to look at this um, in, in, in a very strict manner, and it's going to change the way hotels are. Uh, hotels will not be the same the way it used to be. Um, but again, as we discussed earlier, we don't want to go in and feel like we're in a hospital. But again, you know, we should provide that service, that emotional experience, and the values that we were raised with in the, in the industry itself, and, be, and, and honor it and deliver it, but yet keep the balance, keep the balance of strict standards, health and safety, good partnership. And um, that's how I see it. And I see the design will change. The design will dramatically change from public spaces, from um, guest rooms, I would say a little bit uh, from restaurants perspective. Yes, there'll be a change of design. Anything that is current will be adjusted. Anything that is in the pipeline of upcoming properties, you will see an amendment to the design. There'll be changes to the design, be it around the public spaces, around the reception area, um, you can see most of the hotels that have um, um, presidential suites or executive levels or villas, they're, they're moving forward into um, the in-room guest check-in rather than going on to the reception. So well, you were going to see, I, I see the reception desk idea and all that will dramatically change. You will see a change in that one. Uh, from, a, from, a, from an independent restaurant, I think you'll have lesser tables. Um, you will uh, probably have more concepts coming in, a mix between retail and uh, a dine-in. Uh, you will see the to-go concept growing very strongly. Um, deliveries too, yeah. So that's what I foresee in the future. 
and the incentives are likely to change as well. The travel incentives. What would those? Be? What do you see that? What what changes do you see there? In travel? Uh, well, I think I'm. I, I think traveling is going to be a little bit more expensive. I, I foresee that happening from an airline's perspective and room rates because. Um, uh, I don't think you can you can run those occupancies in hotels that you had before, and for some reason you can run it up to that eighty to ninety percent average occupancy. Um, there will be a rid I think a lot of brands will lose value um, as a brand value, so um, you will you will see travel, but not in the immediate eighteen months. I think you will see an increase growing um, gradually, but not as it used to be. That's what I uh, wanted to predict. It will take time. And I will, and I foresee that many people will probably, well, many travelers will probably go to areas that are more into the eco travel, nature travel, remote islands, uh, uh, up the mountains, you know, lodges, et cetera. Uh, business demands in cities, yes, there will be some travel to that. But again, I, I don't see will, the other one will pick up by far stronger, much more stronger. Do you see with, okay, obviously the, 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 the business uh, uh, event sector is, is likely to change quite a bit. Um, people may have seen the convenience of uh, Zoom conferencing and the like, but uh, do you think that the internet will have such a great impact on that uh, uh, business segment? Oh, I think you will, for sure. We're going to see more people having trusting. I think the word moving forward, I think a key word that I was discussing the other day, word, whether it's hospitality or anything else, it's trust. You know, even a customer or a consumer or a guest comes to your hotel, he's going to have to trust you with his life. I mean, with cleanliness, with safety standards, et cetera. So uh, moving forward, I think many of the entrepreneurs will have to trust their executives, their employees about staying home and working from home. And I foresee that Zoom conferences will grow. People working from home will become the, the, new, the, new, uh, the new idea or moving forward. So uh, yes, I definitely do see that, absolutely. And uh, we will see more and more of that coming in, in the near future. We have had conversations with um, um, some personalities that are, uh, you know, in the thick of uh, uh, conferencing and event management, and they seem to feel that because of the human contact in hospitality, and because of the need for that kind of contact, um, uh, conferencing is likely just to go on. Do you agree? Yes, I do agree, but not in the extent it used to be. We cannot do exhibitions. We cannot do conferencing as big as magnitude or have 500, 500, 500 to 1,000 attendees. I don't see that happening in the very immediate future. It will come back, but it will be come back in a, in a, uh, from, a, from a different design and platform and much more stricter precautionary measures in terms of health and safety. Hello. Which was it? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. did you hear me? Yeah, sorry, sorry, we just had a bit of a uh, black eye. Right. right, so look, um, you deal and you interact with investors all the time. Uh, Absolutely. When it talks about, the, about Africa. Um, how attractive is Africa as an investment destination? Well, it depends. Um, uh, for those investors that have been to Africa, it's, it's still very interesting. Um, I, I know a few investors that are looking into Africa right now. And as I spoke, spoke earlier, uh, my business partner and I um, and others are, are, my other partners are actually very much interested into looking into East Africa. I know um, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, and then also equally Tanzania and on the other part of the continent, Namibia, etc. So Africa is promising. I foresee that, you know, you will see um, um, much more traffic from an investment perspective into Africa related to hotels and restaurants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, that does, um, as a continent, as a pan-African continent, do we need to be doing something uh, as Pan-Africans to respond to how the Europeans are likely to, to, to impose various restrictions uh, into their countries? And should we also have some certain new protocols? 
Um, currently, nobody knows anything, and I, that, that's so it seems to change constantly. And every two weeks, we have new things. I think what I what I suggest is probably to have uh, to take the initiative and develop your own protocol and present that protocol uh, from a travel perspective and to get evaluated on that protocol because nobody has a definite protocol or process in place right now. So that's what I suggest right now. So I think initiative and move it, taking an initiative and taking a step forward to develop your own protocol it will be the best thing to do. Have, have governments up north uh, uh, come up with um, stimulus to help with the recovery of the hospitality and travel industry at the moment? No, no, not at the moment. Not at the, at the moment, at the present time, no, not yet. No, but many restaurants are closed, are currently closed. Uh, the only thing that's working- Then appeal for that? There is. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. So looking to the students of the future, what should students uh, be learning in the world of hospitality? Um, I think times have changed. Remember when we graduated in Switzerland at that point, we're always like aspiring to be general manager of hotels. And I suggest that they probably should look at it. And it's not the same world that we had before because right back then it was pretty much between luxury hotels and motels and budget hotels and deluxe hotels. Right now the industry is so vast and um, with many, many uh, different segments you've got. To echo hotels, echo retreats, boutique hotels, lifestyle hotels, luxury hotels, deluxe hotels. So I suggest taking the direction from an entrepreneurial perspective and putting together the model of hotel management and business management together and earn, again, a few experience, a few years of experience in a hotel and in, um, in a hotel or residential concepts or any other concept, uh, restaurant concept and be versed about it and then go in and become an independent entrepreneur, hospitality entrepreneur will be the best direction to go. Um, that's my that's my opinion in this. I mean, becoming a general manager and then what happens, many general managers do leave their posts and they become consultants, but it's already too late because, you know, times change, people change, behavior change. You know, we came, well, now we're catering to millennials and generation X and centennials. In the next 20 years, you're gonna have a different customer. So I think you need to prepare yourself and gear yourself on becoming much more of a hospitality entrepreneur than just aspiring to be a general manager of a hotel. Okay. Thanks, Dil. Thank you very much for that. Abdul, thank you so much for your time. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you. you been busy, but thank you for making time to have, to have joined this uh, panel discussion. I hope that uh, you'll be available in the very near future for us to invite you again. Oh, it will be my pleasure. It will be my pleasure. And I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in our company, we have uh, something called Education and Leadership Series, where we contribute to hotel school and um, um, other hotel, hospitality institutes by volunteering of getting guest speakers, CEOs of hotel companies, uh, Michelin star chefs to speak, uh, independent chefs. So we need to get back to the industry and to this future generation. And I'm a very strong believer in Africa. So I will be in Africa and I will be working with you guys in Africa. Okay, super. I'll take you up on that, Abdul. And uh, uh, as we also uh, get going with uh, the the upcoming semester, it's definitely an opportunity for us to uh, re-engage. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Abdul Bagli. We thank you very much. He He was coming to us from... Uh, Cairo in Egypt. This concludes the third episode of uh, the Utopia series. Thank you for joining the conversation. The next episode will be the day after tomorrow, Friday the 29th. We will be hosting um, some CEOs uh, that are locally based. One of them is Mr. Peter Ngori, who's the CEO of Abercrombie and Kent. And we'll also have uh, Muna Mwaniki, who is the CEO of Triam. Uh, hospitality. She'll also be joining us to speak a little bit about luxury um, apartments. So having said that, thank you so much, all of you who have taken time to be with us. Look forward to see you on Friday. Have a good afternoon. Kwa